Wakanda forever! Welcome in to the Bro for Squad podcast. We are just a bunch of bros drinking beer and talking movies. This is episode 196, and I am your host, the Mayor Jeff Hornacek. Thank you guys so much for checking us out. Before we get into the movie discussion tonight, let's go around and meet the fellow bros. Begin with the American hero, Nate Thurmond. Nate, we're all uh, big gamblers here on the pod, so if you had to set the odds in Vegas, chances of you being on the naughty list this year, what are we looking at, like minus 600? Um, man, we might even get into like the thousands. Probably probably minus like 1,200 or something like that. Um, I haven't been the best. I mean, I'm not not really mad at it. I don't 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 live the the best life, so we're we'll not see. saints. What what do you think the line was at the start of the calendar year? Like that's probably the live betting line. What do you think it was like Jan Jan one of 2022? Um, probably like minus 1100. Like I, I haven't done anything. <laughs> not a lot like of movement. Yeah, get in good favor, but I mean, I've pretty much lived the same life. So I mean. I'd say you, it'd probably be pretty even. I've, I've probably done some one, one or two shitty things this year to to raise it a little bit, but yeah, that sounds great. who I mean, knows? It's been pretty much a chalk year. Nothing you haven't no upsets. Nothing crazy. Yeah. All right. Well, if you've not listened to our show before, or even if you have, we begin every episode with the most important thing in any bro's life, and that is chest day. And our chest day topic here, I can't guarantee this, but most likely, as far as episodes go, and with the holidays coming up. This will be our last episode that we record in 2022, I can imagine. We might do some movie commentaries around the holiday season. But that being the case, uh, before we left you guys as far as our episodic updates, we wanted to to count down our top five movies. And originally this was a list of three, but we just changed it. Our top five movies of 2022. And then after Nate and I each do that, we actually have an update on a movie draft that he, Cycli, and I did in May, at the end of May, like the halfway point of the year where we tried to predict the best movies from the final six months of 2022. So really putting a bow on this thing um, and kind of reviewing the year for what it was. And and Nate, before we get into our countdown, starting with your number five, how would you evaluate this year for movies? I think you and I kind of had a similar feeling as we were looking through all the things we've watched this year in terms of the quality that we've seen. Uh, Yeah, it was average. Um, I don't think there's anything spectacular. There definitely... Specifically to like the Marvel world, there were some uh, some duds or disappointments, um, and branching over to the the TV series as well. Um, but yeah, it was it was just okay. Not nothing really that blew my socks off. Well, one, and that's probably my number one, but mm-hmm. that's about it. I think we both kind of agreed because of that, because there's so much parody, everything, nothing really pulls away. Uh, it was actually kind of harder, at least for me, yeah, to do the top part of my list because. The stuff I liked, it, it was all pretty even. Like, there wasn't one movie that I was like, damn, that's clearly my number one, which most years there typically is. Mm-hmm. I, I still have that one for this year. I don't think you've seen this one yet. Um, but I need but, to. Huh? Then I need to. Yeah, it, it, it's solid, but we'll get there in a minute. And just uh, sort of to piggyback on what Nate said, if you go back to our 193rd episode, which we recorded about a month ago, we counted down the worst stuff we've watched in 2022. So the opposite of these lists, if you want to hear the stuff, <laughs> stuff we didn't like. Although, I, without Brian being on tonight's episode, there's no chance of any crossover. Like, I could see us having something on our worst list that he has on his best list, just because we have such different tastes sometimes. Yeah, his uh, his enjoyment out of movies is different than anyone else's. Yeah. All right, uh, Nate, what is your number five favorite movie from 2022? And again, the great thing about this now is a lot of quality comes out on streaming. So I think our ability to watch more movies that we want to see has really helped, at least in that part, uh, strengthen the the depth of these lists. Yeah. Um, My number five, and I know I was shitting on Marvel a second ago, but um, my number five this year was Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. Um, I know there was there was a lot of mixed reviews out there with with some of the stuff, and um, it, I mean it wasn't the best Marvel film by by any stretch of the imagination, but I really did like the extension of Wanda's arc coming off of WandaVision. Mm-hmm. Um, and at the end of that, everyone probably had kind of some mixed feelings and saying, "Who is she? Like, is she the villain? Um, she she's played up as, as such a great character for so long." 
um, they really threw this wrench in there at the end of WandaVision. You're like, shit, she's doing some shitty things. So it, it was fun to see that arc develop even more and then kind of some redemption at the end. Um, so we, and it kind of leaves it up in the air, like, what's it going to be going forward? Is she going to follow that path or is she going to kind of revert back into um, her evil ways and getting into the dark hole and trying to get her children again? Or has she realized that's not the right thing to do? Um, yeah. I think for the people out there that wondered, I was one of them, um, like, will the Disney Plus shows actually impact the movies? Mm-hmm. I mean, here's your poster child yeah. for that. There is no for way sure. this movie will make sense in like a billion different ways if you do not watch WandaVision. Yeah. Um, and then it, it had its typical funny light moments, but not as much as maybe in your Thor Love and Thunder, um, where they're making comedians out of some of the characters now. Um, but it saw its light moments. It was fun. Um, seeing the introduction of America uh, Chavez, I thought her interaction with Doctor Strange and traveling through different worlds and was uh, was really fun as well. Um, but yeah, over, overall, I thought it thought, thought it was really solid. I think the, one of the things keeping that movie off my list is, and I've admitted this, I went into that with way too high of expectations. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. And I had a boner by the time I sat down, which maybe I should have got that looked at for other reasons. Was it longer than four hours? <sighs> Who's to say? All right, my number five. I mean, <laughs> what, I don't know how many lists of these two things will ever be together on, but uh, they're now streaming on Disney Plus together, although this was a Disney Plus original and this movie originally was in my had no business being this good list. And that is the Andy Samberg written and voice starring in Chippendale Rescue Rangers. Oh, wow. I've not seen this. Oh, God. It's so talk about like perfectly doing meta with nostalgia. I mean, I love the Chippendale Rescue Rangers show growing up. This tugs on those nostalgic strings, but then also has enough to offer in terms of originality. It's comedic in ways that both adults and kids get, which I think Disney used to be really, really good at. Lately, I think it's they've sort of diverted away from uh, having as much in their movies hu- in terms of humor for adults. But this movie hit that thread perfectly the way they dealt with, uh, and this is something a lot of movies have done to varying degrees of success, but the way they dealt with sort of the trope of like former TV stars now down on their luck in a world that they don't understand trying to sort of make a comeback, I thought was done perfectly. And okay. I was laughing my ass off. You don't even have to be a fan of the original show to think really enjoy this, but you'll get a little bit more out of it. And the cartoon character cameos in it are probably close to the triple digits. In fact, I had to watch a YouTube video because there was some that I missed. <laughs> yeah, I don't even think this was on my radar, but you explained kind of the premise there uh, that the sounds like something i would i would enjoy and just looking at the voice cast on this this is <laughs> it's insane you got yeah. sandberg Mulane, milani uh, john john Mullaney, sorry uh eric banna will arnett uh, will arnett Michael voices Key. a grown-up animated peter pan who didn't go back <laughs> to neverland so now he's like a little bit overweight and he has like a five o'clock shadow and he can't find any acting roles because they obviously want Young Peter Pan who can fly, and he's yeah not in the best shape of his life anymore. You said this on Disney Plus. Yeah, it was a Disney Plus original. Oh, nice. Okay, I'll have to give yeah. that a shot then. I was very surprised how good it was. All right, what's your number four? Number four, um, I believe Netflix original, um, Hustle. Um, oh, yeah. Adam Sandler surprising me with uh, a, a movie of quality. Um, this uh, keep your eyes peeled for the Brosker nomination list. This one <clears> there, yeah. After after some some duds through Netflix, um, but no, the, the, this one was great. It's I mean it's a sports movie, so it's all automatically going to draw me in. Um, and Sandler did a great job in this one. He actually felt committed. I know he's a huge basketball fan. <laughs> You'll see clips of him all the time, like an LA Fitness, like hooping it up with some guys. So mm-hmm. um, this may have been like that one passion project that kind of got him back into it. Um, which it showed. Uh, it was cool having some like actual NBA players in there, whether they're uh, playing themselves, like Dirk and Luca, or or Boban playing a 15 year old, whatever Serbian <laughs> guy. Try- Allegedly, dude, Allegedly Anthony Edwards was really old. good as Kermit Washington. Also, I thought. Yeah, yeah, he really did. Kind of playing that that um, that an, uh, antagonist um, to to the main character. Now I can't remember the main character's name. Bo. Yeah, something slipping slip my mind. Um, but yeah, yeah, it, it had a lot going for it. Um, 
And like I said, it was, I mean, it was almost paint by numbers as far as like what happened and how the arc and everything went. Like down on his luck guy found and he goes with him. They go up and down and finally get to where he makes the NBA and then finally cu- catches a break. But, um, but yeah, I thought, I thought it was done really well. Um, like I said, Sandler actually put some effort into this one and it showed. Yeah. Bo Cruz was the character's name and friend of the pod, Ben Foster movie as well. Ben, yeah. Ben Foster in a random role. Um, <laughs> still kind of played that. I played a dick, I guess, but yeah, I mean, he's never like the good guy. I feel like no, not really interested. Yeah. That was my number four. I like it. All right. My number four a movie that I just saw. And again, talk about surprising the hell out of me. Uh, and this might be recency biased, but, I really fucking love this movie. And that is the Ray Fiennes comedy thriller, The Menu, that I just watched in theaters last week. Is that the, like, chef restaurant thing? Yes. Dang it. Okay, I need to see that. Where a bunch of people show up to this high-end restaurant that's on a secluded island that's part of the experience, and they realize uh, about the time the appetizers come out, they're actually going to get killed by the chef. Um, But I got to say, this movie had two of the most laugh-out-loud moments of any movie I've seen this year. Really? Very surprising. Yeah. I mean, I was utterly shocked and maybe it was so funny because it took maybe four or five swings at comedy and they all hit with rousing success. Um, but it was just a unique concept. The trailer, I don't think gave it near enough credit, um, because there's quite a bit, uh, to this, that a lot of really interesting ideas that I really, really enjoyed. And I went in with, moderate expectations and was yeah. utterly impressed and i don't re- I, i've seen the trailer i've probably seen it pop up on tv a couple times and i don't remember too much about it it piqued my interest um but yeah to, to your point i don't think it may be um hit too much on the, the comedy aspect of it it's had some laugh out loud moments oh absolutely um, because yeah i see more way more thriller which i know on imdb it's tagged as a comedy horror thriller so and horror like i get conceptually there's some like kind of eerie and creepy things about it but i don't even think there's one jump scare in this really yeah more and just like gore, a straight up thriller yeah gore wise i don't really think there's anything you know there's a there's one scene but nothing too ridiculous this one just in theaters yeah i think it came out okay. like two weeks ago okay still there the menu highly Sweet. recommend yeah i'll right. watch that one nate what's your number three Number three, and uh, this one was one that I watched probably within the past month. I actually think I talked about it on the last pod episode I was on. Um, but it crept up there, um, and it, it's it's staying in the top movies for this year. Um, it's the Olivia Wilde-directed, Florence Pugh-acted, Don't Worry Darling. Um, I, I don't know. I really enjoy this one. I, I aesthetically it was really great i think the cinematography was really well done on this um and it's it's cool like w- the environment it's shot in um which is like the 1950s or something mm-hmm. um and there are and i don't think i actually talked about it too much on the last one just because i didn't want to give any spoilers away was that okay i just saw this too based on your recommendation were we not on pod at the same time like have we talked about this together I don't think so. I'm trying to think when I I'm going to my letterbox to figure out when I last watched this. <clears throat> but I really enjoyed it. Um, the it it it's uh, man. I don't even want to say some things just for spoiler. Well, you've seen it, so if you don't want any spoilers, then skip ahead like two minutes. Um, but with that being said, so like the VR stuff and like living in virtual reality, kind of topical with things going on. I thought it was pretty interestingly played. Um, how, uh, Harry Styles character. Um, I mean, for basically selfish reasons, he doesn't get enough time with his wife because she's a nurse, um, and finds this way to let, let them live supposedly happily ever after in this, in this virtual reality world and how it starts cracking apart and falling apart and Florence Pugh finding out about it. Um, I thought it was really well done. I don't think it's getting the greatest of reviews, um, but overall, I really enjoyed it. Dude, I I don't think somehow I don't don't think I logged this after I watched it, which I fucked up. Yeah, I fucked up because I watched this off your recommendation. I was already I think most people were intrigued. Yeah, uh, just based on the 
sort of the the I don't even want to say marketing, but like the narrative surrounding this movie's release, like the drama on set. Oh yeah, outside of the actual movie, <laughs> you can almost make a movie of that. Um, yeah. But there was a there was a huge swing for the fences twist at the end, and for me, it worked. Me like, too. Yeah. So. Yeah. I don't, I don't uh, want to say too much more in case somebody came back that hasn't had it spoiled. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry if you you didn't skip that part. Um, and uh, but yeah, I thought I thought it unwrapped well. I thought they gave you enough nuggets throughout to kind of piece it together on your own if you wanted to try. Um, but then yeah, the the actual reveal, I I enjoyed it. It was really cool. Yeah, it's one of those movies where like the twist, I would never guess the first time watching it. But th- like as far as having the plausible plausible deniability from the film's perspective, they can sit back and say. Well, it makes sense because we gave you some breadcrumbs. Mm-hmm. Oh, for sure. Yeah, they're definitely in there. Damn, when did I fucking watch this now? I mean... <laughs> yeah, because I think, I mean, I may have talked about it uh, in my protein shake like a month or so ago, and then you may have been on an episode without me in, be- in between, probably. I can't believe I forgot to log this. I'm embarrassed and ashamed of myself. Egg on your face. All right. Um anyway. What's your number three slot? All right. My number three movie uh, is The Batman. The Batman. Yes. Another thing currently on HBO Max. Much anticipated, obviously. Um, Robert Pattinson, I thought, was incredible. The runtime is a bit long, but I didn't think that I could enjoy a serious take on Batman as much as I enjoyed the Christopher Nolan trilogy. Mm -hmm. And for me, this one, it's not up there with The Dark Knight. It's up there with Batman Begins, for sure. Maybe even slightly better than Batman Begins. And I just, as a, a big Batman fan for my entire life, I felt like this was per- like one of the perfect iterations of him. I know that with DC, we don't know where this exists. Like, is this in the Todd Phillips Joker universe? Yeah. It's probably not in the DC proper universe, unless there's some weird Flashpoint paradox shit that happens. But... Again, I think a lot of people have gotten to the point with DC where I don't care, just make a quality movie, and that's what this was. Incredible score. Paul Dano overacted a little bit in this, I will say. Um, Yeah, a touch. But for the most part, this was a near-perfect film for me. And again, the only thing that kept me from watching it multiple times this year is the fact that it takes three days to to get through. Yeah, and that's probably what – that's one of the things that kept it out of my top five um, because I enjoyed it, and honestly – once it got on, I saw it in the theaters, and then uh, once it came on HBO Max, I started to watch it again, and just something came up, got distracted, and <laughs> probably about halfway through, but I was like, oh, God, it's so long. Um, so it, uh, I didn't get all the way through it again. Um, but yeah, I still think a great film. Um, I think Pattinson played a great Batman. I know one of the knocks um, he was getting is maybe he wasn't the best Bruce Wayne Um yeah, he was just a different Bruce Wayne. Yeah, he was. I mean, it was different. Um, so I know, still, the acting was great and everything. It, it dragged a little bit, um, but yeah, I mean, I still think it was uh, a great film in and of, of itself. And it was some. I mean, it came out much earlier in the year, but it really stuck with me. Like I still remember a lot of it and being very interested in how the mystery yeah. played out. And loved uh, Colin Farrell as Oswald Cobblepot. Man, some of the best best prosthetics on him. I was going to say, they better win an Oscar for makeup for that. If, yeah, if you didn't know it was, was Colin Farrell, you would not guess no. that that was him. All right, Nate, what is your number two? Dose. Um, number two, uh, Top Gun Maverick. Nice. And I know this one, I mean, it had a, a ton of hype around it. Um, been 30 whatever years since the other one came out. Um but man, it really held up. Um, yeah. Did it have its corny moments? Yes. Was it cheesy? A lot of the parts were. That's what that's what Top Gun was originally. I mean, you still had those moments, but I think it's a huge credit to them and Tom Cruise, especially because he's just a fanatic and a nut. But he really did his homework. Um, the production crew really did their homework. They invested a lot of money into this. They got they got the air they got the fighter jet scenes right. Um, they got a little, a lot of the subtleties, right. Um, speaking with one of our friends who's actually in the air force and a pilot, um, kind of talked on some of those things as well. So that was impressive too. Like the terminology and the verbiage that they used while fighting and while flying was great. Um, and yeah, just some of those scenes, I know whatever G's they were pulling, maybe not 
maybe not be a uh, true in real life, but I mean, you're watching a movie, so that's something you got to accept. But um, yeah, just the fighting scenes were great. And it, it really blew me out of the water because going into, it, I wasn't like a huge top gun original fan, um, but coming out of the movie theater after seeing that, I was, I was stoked. It was great. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think it's for me to say, I think it's better than the original. It's sort of a generational thing because the OG one that came out in the 80s, like we watch it and it's like a fun movie for what it is. Yeah. But aside from the soundtrack, there's really no part of it to me that is like elevated film. Mm-hmm. Uh, the soundtrack's incredible, obviously. But this one what, in Dolby Cinemas in theaters was a fucking blast. And there's enough of a story there and enough of an interesting character in Maverick that it can get you through the rest of it and feel like it's better than your standard run of the mill action film. I feel like. Yeah, I thought there was enough there. Um, and they really kind of hammered home like the plans for the the flights and the plans for like the overall mission. So you were right. really enveloped in it. Um, and they kept going over and over again. And um, yeah, they, it just really drew you in with everything. And like, and like you said, there was enough of a story to keep you interested the whole time. That was an honorable mention for me. So ah, just, okay. All right. Way. All right. My number two came out all the way back in January. Um, and cycling, I at the time loved this movie. We saw it in theaters together, but I don't, it's obviously really hard to tell the first month of the year, but I don't think we would have guessed it would still be not only a top, a top five list at this time of the year, but in the top two. And that is the legacy sequel scream. Ooh, really? Yeah. Our boy Jack Quaid from The Boys stars, mm-hmm. along there with Jenna Ortega, who you can watch now in the Wednesday series on Netflix. Um, second best Scream movie of all time. Very close to the original for me. Incredible whodunit. Uh, really interesting plot. The meta element, it plays it perfectly because it gets to work off of all the tropes that legacy sequels use. So they talk about, like, which legacy characters will die and which legacy characters get to live. Okay. <laughs> How the new characters have to have some relation to the characters from the original series. It yeah. just gets to play in this pool, and it's all this new fodder for meta humor that it just works perfectly. Yeah, I'm not a huge horror guy, but I might have to give this one a shot. Obviously, I saw the original. Um I don't think yeah, I think required viewing is probably just the original. Like, there's characters okay. from the others and some nice references, but this one really plays off the story of the first one. Okay, I can probably give this one one a shot and um, put in my big boy britches for once. I think uh, you'll appreciate seeing Jack Quaid in a in something else too. Yeah, I uh, I've enjoyed him and everything I've seen him. So it's pleasant to put that one on the list. Nice. All right, Nate, nitty gritty. <laughs> What's your number one movie? Numero uno. Obviously, there's still a few weeks left. Like Avatar hasn't come out. Babylon hasn't come out. But I think we can safely say this is where our list will stand. We can make revisions if need be. I mean, to be honest, I've never seen the original Avatar. So (laughs) we'll see if I see the other one. I don't know. It's just like at this point, like, do I see it? If you start it now, you might be able to finish by the time the second one comes out. That is true. Okay, I'll get started right after the pod. Um. Coming in at number one for me for 2022 is All Quiet on the Western Front. Wow. Um, Now, I mean, this one has Oscar grabs all over it. Um, And, well, it's actually funny because I think I text you about this or someone else like, Maybe a month before it came out, I was like, did you know this is coming out? How how have we not heard about this? Yeah, totally. I mean, again, Netflix, they suck at marketing their shit because I had no idea until you told me about this. We've talked we talked about this three, four years ago, how they suck at marketing their stuff. Yes. Um we have to do their work for them. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome, Netflix. I'll wait for the check in the mail. Um but yeah, I, I had no idea how I didn't know this was coming out. Um a remake of a, a classic coming off of <clears throat> a classic novel as well. But man, this one was phenomenal. Um it's foreign film, all in German, but I should, I think that adds to the to the mystique of it. Um, but the, and I, I think I talked about on don't worry, darling, like the uh, cinematography and how it was shot and everything. All quiet on the Western front is phenomenal. Um, and it kind of lends to that because it's world war one, you're in the trenches. Mm-hmm. Um, so you get a lot of 1917 vibes. Um, is it black and white? I'm seeing some stills here. Uh, no, so. okay. it's not black and white. 
Um, percent on Rotten Tomatoes for this thing. Yeah, but the uh, but the cinematography is great. The acting in it is phenomenal. Um, the story, I don't know if it deviated from the book much or not, or from the original movie. Don't care because I really enjoyed it. Um, and it, the novel was originally written by someone who was actually in World War One on the German side in the trenches. Um, and so you really get that in-depth aspect. Um, you get that humanization of the person, of the soldier. Um, there are a ton of emotions that the main character goes through and a ton of situations are put in that makes them act in different ways, um, split-second decisions and things like that that really show um, – like what's going through a soldier's mind. Um, but it, it was it was phenomenal. It'll be up for Oscars and awards, and I fully support it. This might be a dumb question, but looking at the cast, I see our boy uh, Baron Zemo, Daniel Brohl, is in it. Does mm-hmm. he, I'm assuming he speaks – everyone speaks German in the movie? Uh, yeah, except for the French people. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. They're literally yeah. fighting so they don't have to speak German. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a little French in there. And – uh, Daniel Brühl, he, I mean, he plays a big character in it. He's maybe in the movie like fifteen percent of the time, um, but he plays an important character. He's a higher up in the army, um, is negotiating. Um, so um, he's in it a bit, but I mean, he's far and away from the main character. He has now been in an excellent World War One and World War Two movie. This and World War One, and then Inglorious Bastards. Yes. Yep. And a great Civil War movie, Captain America Civil War. There you go. <laughs> yes. There we go. <laughs> what a great tie-in. He's out there scouting Vietnam War scripts right now. Yep. Um, this one was a bit long. This was a, a two-part watch session. I split okay. that in half with the wife. Um, but I'll, I'll, probably, I'll probably go back and watch this, re-watch this in the next month or so. It was, it was great. Yeah, very interested in this. The I believe the original one from the 30s we had to watch in school, and obviously at the time I saw it, I just didn't really give a fuck about it and appreciate it as much. Yeah. So it'll be good to give this a view with my more mature. I'm so mature, obviously. So mature. Yeah. That's a good. All again, right. you always do a good job of legitimizing our list with like actual. Good yeah, I, I mean, I I feel like that was low hanging low hanging fruit, um, but. It lives. It lived up to all my hype that I put on it. Yeah, I like how we have lists where you can have Doctor Strange, Top Gun, and All Quiet on the Western Front in it. Yeah, I think they're all great movies. My list will end with a movie very different from my number five, which was Chippendale Rescue Rangers, and that is the only movie this year that made me cry. Oh, and that is the Amazon original starring John Cho. Don't make me go. Did you end up watching this? I know I recommend don't it, but... make me go. Yes, I did. Oh, boy. Uh, I won't spoil anything because the ending really fucking rips your heart out in in ways you're not expecting. Um, But it was the – would you say it's a dramedy or just a straight-up drama with a few lighthearted moments? Uh, Hold on. I'm trying to think back. Uh, I'd say, man, that is tough because putting dramedy on it, like I feel like there would be more – yeah, I'd I'd say a drama with some lighthearted moments. Yeah. The point is, John Cho is a uh, single father with a, I think, 15, maybe she's yeah, older. She's in high school. I don't yeah, know. 15 or 16-year-old daughter, who their mom is has left the family long ago. She's out of the picture. And he gets some news from his doctor that he has a very serious, I think it's a brain tumor. Um, and he there's a very risky, high-risk surgery that he can have to have the tumor removed in a few months. And he doesn't tell his daughter this, but he decides to take her on a cross-country road trip during the summer to try and find her mother, his ex-wife, and have them reconnect because, unbeknownst to her, there's a chance he might not be around much longer. Yeah. <laughs> and it's about their relationship and her coming of age. And it's just, I don't have a child, um, but I cannot imagine you having a kid and watching this film and not shedding tears at the end like it just utterly fucking gutted me and was just so well done and again huge surprise like i saw the trailer and i thought i would like it but i didn't know it would have this big of an effect on me yeah like the i I mean it's a twist but i almost don't want to call it a twist but i don't know what to call it it's just it's like out of left field 
Yeah. Is it is it shoehorned in? I don't think so. Um, because I think there's things that preface it during the movie that they show you later. They're like, okay. Mm-hmm. Um, but man, and then, yeah, just like the last last 10 minutes are just gut wrenching. Oh, I'll just say that. Oh my God. Yeah, I know. I'm kind of getting choked up just thinking about it again. <laughs> um, yeah. So if you watch it, have the tissue box ready. Um, yeah. But very well made. Uh, and just one of those movies that just makes us feel something, which is always nice. Yeah. All right. Those are our list. Did you have any honorable mentions? I had one other award I wanted to give out to one film, but I don't know if you had anything else you want to talk about. Um, no, that was about it. And I honestly kind of forgot about don't was don't let me go. Yeah. Don't make me go. Don't make me go. That's what I, th- okay. I'm going to throw that in as my honorable mention though. Now that I'm thinking about it. <laughs> there you go. I just had a movie that I, I know you and your wife were like, lukewarm on it but i gave it the award of had no business being this good and that was the michael bay directed ambulance (laughs) ambulance yeah which uh is a movie i feel like i'm gonna be talking about for many years on this podcast (laughs) that's but but uh, yeah even as we were kind of lukewarm on it i think that's one i can go back and and rewatch and still enjoy um and there were some good there were some good moments in it i feel like part of my enjoyment of it might be the setup I got to watch it on. So those ah. things at home, Nate Thurman and his wife bought us a pretty badass like subwoofer and like loudspeaker that we hook up to our projector in our front room and watching ambulance on that <laughs> thing. It's it was it's like better than the theaters. Michael Bay does not jip you on bass sounds. No. I can still hear in my head the like oh. the nonstop bullet noises. Yep. Although there is one scene in that movie, I don't know if you remember it. It's just two people talking. It's uh, Jake Gyllenhaal and Yaya Abdul Mateen, and he has this fucking crane shot like rotating around them in this conversation, and it is wild how obnoxious it is. Well, I think I text you like during or right after, him, like the drone foot, the drone oh, budget on this God. thing must have been insane. Yeah, yeah, they were just drones all over the place, circling and doing all this shit. Yeah, he this is one, of, Bay. one of those movies where he's like, uh, all I need is two actors people have heard of, and the rest of the money's going to fucking drones. Yeah. And we're all set. Yeah. All right, that's our top five movies of the year. Again, obviously a few uh, weeks left, but um, we can make revisions. I doubt we'll need it. Yeah. The last thing before we move on to our protein shake, uh, on, I believe the episode was dropped, like I said, very last uh week of May, Nate Thurmond, Ronnie Cycle, and I performed a Movies Remaining in 2022 draft, where we each drafted five movies from the remaining six months of films to be released. And we said that we were going to go back and average out their ratings on IMDb and see who could end up with the highest uh, average among those five movies. And Nate, I don't remember, did, what were the stakes? I'm sure we had something on the line. Is it like someone gets to pick a commentary or what? Um, you know, that's a good question. And ten thousand dollars? Yeah, ten thousand dollars is I think what it was. Okay. Um I'm just gonna Cycle's not on here to defend himself, but I'm I'm gonna say next time we meet up all three of us, uh, the first round is on the loser. That's fair. Yeah. Um, all right. So Nate, I guess the best way to do this, we have the averages now, although with mm-hmm. the, uh, some of us, you have a movie that hasn't come out yet. And cycling yeah. has one that even with a substitution, it got pushed to next year. <laughs> Actually, I have one that Sorry. hasn't come out yet either. So we all have four that are going in this total. Uh, why don't you tell the people the five you drafted and then, uh, your, uh, overall average, although that's an oxymoron, I guess your average rating. Yeah. On so we, got uh, I drafted Thor love and thunder. Um, I drafted Disappointment Boulevard, which got pushed. Um, luckily, early enough to where I could grab another movie, and I grabbed Amsterdam. Um, I drafted Hustle, uh, 13 Lives, and then my last movie, which will come out in about two weeks, Avatar The Way of Water. Um, so my highest ranked one right now is 13 Lives. Um, the Doing very true, well. Yeah, the true, the true story um, with Colin Farrell about the uh, soccer team who got trapped in the cave. Um, my lowest one right now is Amsterdam. I have yet to see that one as well. Um, heard bad things. It's one of those that like the cast is so huge. You're like, this movie is fucked. It's It's too much. Yeah, (laughs) it's too much. Um, but my overall, my average 
right now is a 6.9. Um, so we'll we'll leave that as it is. We won't reveal anyone else's um, right now until the end. So that's where we're sitting right now. Still got Avatar and Avatar. Fuck, I don't know. I was telling horns off pod about that. I mean, I could see that being an 8.2. I could see that being a 5.7. I have no yeah. idea where that's going to go. But again, when we get to how close uh, the team ahead of you is, if Avatar can get you in the low sevens, that might be enough to push you ahead. We'll see. <clears throat> All right, Cycle's five movies. So he had Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. Uh, he had Nope. The Bob's Burgers movie. Um, Shazam. Did he was Shazam a replacement or did he have something else before? That was a replacement for Creed three. That's right. He had Creed yeah. three, which got pushed, and then Shazam. <laughs> Shazam also got pushed. And then he had Halloween Ends as his final film. So Halloween Ends is his low uh, performer with a five even rating on IMDb. Ech. And it, Yeah. His top performer right now is Black Panther Wakanda Forever with a 7.3. And his overall average is a 6.55, putting him almost 0.4 behind Nate. So not looking good. For him. No, and like really, the only one until the end of the year. He's got a month left. Black Panther could go up or down. Um, yeah, everything else I'm pretty sure is pretty cemented in. Yeah, the only other thing, and again, not much movement's going to happen here. But Nope recently got released on Peacock, so the chance that more people could oh, watch it. Good call out. Yeah, okay. but again, not as much. I mean, how many people are watching that in the holiday season to really move the needle here? Tough to yeah. say. All right, so Cycle six point five five. Nate 6.9 that leaves me my five were the movie Nate actually mentioned earlier I had Top Gun Maverick which I got pretty lucky with that was like my uh, Tom Brady fifth round draft pick yeah then I had another Nate top five movie Don't Worry Darling then I had uh, Lightyear which is my first round bust DC <laughs> League of Super Pets I was thinking kids movies often do well and then a movie which I'm actually nervous is going to fuck me over, which comes out on December 23rd, and that is the Margot Robbie Brad Pitt Babylon, which uh, the trailer is just kind of obnoxious. Yeah. Yeah, so we're going to come down to the battle. I mean, really, sorry, Cycle, I don't think you're going to get a movie to replace Shazam at this point, but um, Babylon versus Avatar, because... Yeah, I'm sorry, my total is 6.98, yeah. so I'm .08 ahead of Nate. Man. You know? Yeah, so I guess... Looking at it that way, if it, it is going to come down to Babylon versus Avatar, and I don't like my chances. <laughs> Man, we'll see. I don't know. I, I mean, <clears throat> yeah, it's a, there's a lot. I mean, Avatar could come in below, and you could kind of stay around 6-9 and, and win it. So There are some Avatar haters out there. I'm just wondering, there are also a lot of Avatar fanboys. So which, yeah. of, which of those groups are louder? We're going to find out. It'll be interesting. We will... Uh, Keep you guys updated. I guess we'll cut it off New Year's Eve. Yeah. So we'll go and update. And we'll check to see if any of the other movies' ratings have changed. But if you're listening out there, go on to IMDb and skew the ratings for whichever one of us you like more. Ooh, I like Get it. a bunch of bot accounts and just fucking vote your asses off. There we go. All right, next part of our show, our protein shake, where we go around and talk about what is in our cup, also known as what have we watched lately? Let's do a little uh, back and forth. Nate, what have you seen since we last spoke to you? Uh, let's see here. Uh, we'll start off with Yellowstone. Um, season five dropped recently. I'm actually not caught up, but I've seen the first two episodes. Okay, um, so what is this on? Because my mom was trying to watch it, and I know it's on Hulu and Peacock. I don't know which one is like the – one of them did not have the new season. Paramount. So oh, I think cool. it should be on Paramount Plus. Okay, maybe it's not on Hulu then, Paramount. Yeah. Right. Good to know. Sorry to interrupt. No, you're good. Um, so, I mean, this one honestly is kind of uh, running out of time in my opinion. Um, I don't know how many seasons they're going to have on this, but it's just kind of getting a little over the top. They're trying to, like, one-up themselves. Um, it's losing me a little bit, but I've stuck with it for four seasons, so I'll probably finish it out. And th there's enough going on that that's – keeping me interested so it's just meh like first two seasons i'd probably rate it like an eight it's probably down around a six five now at this point um but still got kevin costner in it and i like some of the other ancillary char characters as well in there so it's keeping me around yeah this might be one of those shows that um because of the because it's on a streaming service that 
needs quality content and not to shit on Paramount Plus, but like they're yeah. they need original programming that resonates with people. They're probably gonna milk it till it's like getting blood out of a stone. Oh, for sure. And obviously they've done that with the spinoffs. And again, I I haven't seen them and. I really like the talent involved, like Harrison Ford, Helen Mirren, and uh, what's our fucking boy, the greatest Western actor of all time. Oh, uh, Elliot, Sam Elliot. Sam Elliot, yeah, in the in the two spinoffs. But again, like, how big is the Yellowstone verse going to get before we're like, all right, that's enough. Yeah. We'll see. I actually even saw Kevin Costner's doing, like, a documentary series based on it, too. Yeah, and it's on, like, Discovery or something. It's not even on Paramount, which is weird. That is odd. Hey, subscribe to that one, too. Thanks. <laughs> yeah yeah i don't know um all right what do you i got? watched i'm not gonna talk about this because i already mentioned earlier but i saw the menu in theaters and ah. highly highly recommend go check it out nice. this one i do want to talk about because nate i think one of the reasons and i was talking to banner about this off pod before we got on one of the reasons that i love this documentary so much is there is an analogous moment in our lives as young adults that was one of my favorite memories that i have as a human being Mm-hmm. And that is the Redeem Team documentary ah. on Netflix. So if you don't know the story here, this is the 2008 U.S. men's basketball team, Olympic basketball team, that was coming off of the first time in the modern era that the U.S. men's basketball team did not win the gold medal in 2004 when we got bronze in Athens, Greece. And the strategy behind rebuilding USA men's basketball and getting us on top of the world because Spain was actually ranked first in the FIBA rankings was continuity with the coaching staff. So they brought in coach Mike Krzyzewski from Duke to coach the team in the world championships two years prior and then in the Olympics. And then they also asked players for a four-year commitment. And the highlight of this is, of course, Kobe Bryant was brought in to spearhead a team led by LeBron James, Carmelo Anthony, and Dwayne Wade. But... Nate, if you want to take this as a jumping off point, there's a moment in the gold medal game against Spain that I believe will best be known in our lives as Kobe time, which took place at about 2 a.m. Central Standard Time uh, and involved a clutch play by the Black Mamba. Yeah, and to be honest, I may have been intoxicated at this point. I'm sure I was. And it's it's a blurry moment. Um, But, I mean, overall, I mean, yeah, this was just a great time and, like, leading up to it, was incredible because we knew if we brought in the right talent we could (laughs) we could show up anyone in the world and they came and it it gave us many moments like jeff was talking about which i'll let him allude to and then um olympics mellow was a thing that we we would always talk about like yeah he was decent in the nba but get him into the olympics and he's he's a different (laughs) player he's insane there's a quote in the movie two quotes uh and then i'll let it go because you just have to go watch it There's one quote where, so Kobe Bryant is known as being like this insane competitor. And him and Pau Gasol are not only teammates and great friends. Pau Gasol is the godfather to one of his daughters. But before the gold medal game, uh, USA Basketball is watching film. And there's this set play that Spain likes to run where Pau Gasol sets a pick on one of the guards at the top of the key for Ricky Rubio. And Kobe told his teammates, he said, to set the tone, the first play of the game I'm going to get a foul. I'm going to run right through Pau's fucking chest. And LeBron goes, all right, Kobe, like, whatever. First play of the game, Kobe gets a foul and a warning because he literally destroys Pau Gasol on the ground. And the look on Pau Gasol's face is like, okay, we're fucking playing for real. Yeah. Yeah, like, once all friendships are thrown out the door, it does not matter. Kobe doesn't give a fuck. No. He is, I mean, that was the Mamba mentality. (laughs) Another great line uh, in the the uh, documentary is in the gold medal game. Um, Chris Paul picked up like three really quick fouls. He was the point guard on the team. Like Ricky Rubio was just kind of destroying him on on the offensive end. And Dwayne Wade uh, comes into the game and actually had twelve straight points in the second quarter for Team USA. And th- they actually have Ricky Rubio in the documentary briefly. And Ricky Rubio said, "I knew <laughs> that we should be worried because LeBron James." turns to me and goes, are y'all scared? And Ricky Ruby goes, why would I be scared? And LeBron goes, Dwayne Wade comes off our fucking bench. <laughs> and then Dwayne Wade proceeded to score 12 straight points in the tide of the game quickly. <laughs> but just the, to hear the mind game, and it's pretty unfiltered. Like, Chris Bosh drops a ton of F-bombs in this also. So to, to hear these guys, like, uncandid is pretty fun. 
like no other team is having Hall of Famers coming off the bench. Right. It's insane. It's like y'all scared? He's like, why would we be scared? Dwayne Wade comes off our fucking bench, bro. Yeah, I need to still haven't got around to that one, but I I can't wait until I do watch it. I'm excited. Good shit. All right. What else have you seen? Um, I'll touch on this one briefly. Just watched this over the uh, Thanksgiving break, being back at home. Um, because my I, don't know, I was talking to my father in law and he had not seen this movie yet, and I love it. Um, Hell or High Water. Uh, yeah, another Ben that. Foster classic. Man, Ben Foster, Jeff Bridges, Chris Pine. Um, man, I, I, I mean, I was telling him it was like one of my favorite modern westerns. I mean, just throw it in with all the westerns. It may just be one of my favorite ones. Um, I think it's really well done. I think the story and plot is great. I think it wraps up well. Um, What's this Br- on? Uh, I think we watched Netflix. I think okay. it's on Netflix. But man, it just has so many good moments. And then, I mean, Jeff Bridges just plays that Texas Southern draw from West oh, Texas so, so well. Yeah. And yeah, anything with Ben Foster in it. Um, I'm a huge fan of 310 to Yuma as well, which he plays a crazy guy in a Western. So good. Um, so yeah, anything with him in it is going to be. It's going to be pretty high on my list. So I somehow that haven't one. seen this. I know you've been recommending it for years, so I, I definitely need to check this out. Yeah, that's so. great. Um, I'll roll into this one because I know we're both watching this one, um, and I'm currently one episode behind. Um, but the uh, season two, White Lotus, which is based in um, Sicily, Italy. Um, but we, we love the first season. Jumping into the second one. Um, what are your thoughts so far on it? Dude, I am having trouble not being too hyperbolic with how much I fucking love this show. Like, I went, f- I love season one. Armand, the character in season one, is maybe one of my favorite television characters of like the last four or five years. Kind of upset there's not a real Armand in this one. Um, <laughs> and I'm still trying to figure out the current um, resort hostess or yes. resort manager. I'm not. I'm not sure what her deal is. It's got to be going somewhere, and I think I see where it's going, but there's no way that I'm like, yeah, right. You, on you may have a little bit more information seeing the last episode, but I mean, playing more or less a bitch to everyone, but there are these lighter moments, um, specifically with one person, really. Um, but the, so far, I mean, I, I'm digging it so far. There's a lot of setup. Yes. Um, acting is great, interaction between characters is great. I like the relationships they're building. Um, I like how they build and tree the first five minutes of the show, um, just like they did last time with not just one dead body, several dead bodies. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we're, we're trying to lead up and see where that goes. Um, and that's always fun trying to piece together, which in season one, I did not see the dead body coming from where it came from. So no. I'm sure I won't see it this time. Um, yeah. I have to say two things. If you need yeah. a pitch for White Lotus, it is a dark humor whodunit. Mm-hmm. With the most interesting uh, characters that you could possibly find on any TV show. Like this season, especially, there's like several plot threads that kind of interweave because these characters are staying at a resort and so they kind of, you know, see each other here and there. Last or season one, there was a few, like Steve Zahn's family, I wasn't as interested in. This season, yeah. like every time they cut to like a new story, I'm like scooting closer to the TV. I'm like, fuck yeah, what's going on with them? Yeah, and just like uh, this is kind of a common theme from the first season, but ninety-five percent of the characters don't have too many redeeming qualities. No, um, there's there's usually like one or two. And actually, funny enough that I'm thinking about it, the son, like the mm-hmm. the main son in both of these, they, they're probably the most redeeming people there so far. Yeah. Um. So we'll see where that goes. Uh, the other thing I was going to say, pay it. Uh, you might have probably noticed this, but it's gotten more and more awesome to me even though it's the same every single episode as the show's gone on and the intro music and like (laughs) credits to this show are fucking incredible like i don't know if there's an emmy for that but it needs to be (laughs) best intro and music uh there should be i need to pay more attention to that because i'm sure there's some hidden meanings and things and that but i know it like changes every time and they're showing like italian architecture and art and all this kind of stuff (laughs) Everyone's naked and fucking something in the imagery. And then the song is like starts as like these Greek goddesses singing, but then it turns into like la 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 <laughs> people tonguing someone's balls as they sing. It's pretty hilarious. Uh, my 
after this pod, I might go catch up on the last episode. So yeah, text me your thoughts because the last scene of it is cool. Pretty much. I just got one more thing. What do you got? Uh, I have two, really. Regardless, go ahead. Um, I saw Black Panther: Wakanda Forever in theaters. Yeah. The holidays I, got in the way. I've been meaning to see this and just haven't got to it yet. Yeah, I'll save most of my thoughts for when one of the other bros have seen it, and I'll wait a little while so we can talk spoilers. But cool. um, lots of people crying in my theater. My wife was bawling her fucking eyes out for good reason. As you could imagine, yeah. Yeah, it opens with some tear jerkers and it ends with, uh, oh, did you have any tears left? Well, sorry, bye. Yeah, we're going to get your reserve tear ducts going. And I had high hopes for this, and it lived up to it. Um, not as good as the first Black Panther, but uh, that's a movie I might talk about here in a second, actually. Spoiler alert. Um, but uh, in a phase four of the MCU that has been all over the place, I really needed to end the Marvel Cinematic Universe calendar year with a success, and this provided that. So great to see all the cast back. Story's really interesting. Namor is a great villain, uh, and I'm excited to see his possible potential in the MCU going forward. Um, it was a little long, especially in the second act, but again, solid MCU entry. Very good. And uh, Nate, when you ever go see it, we'll have to talk here on pod because there are some cool characters that play a role that I was not expecting to see in this movie. Okay. Nice. Um, okay. One other thing I'll mention. Yeah, Marvel go for it. Cinematic universe related. I just watched the guardians of the galaxy holiday special. I saw that pop up on Disney plus. Yeah, uh, 45 minutes, the second special presentation Marvel has released, the second one, or the first one being Werewolf by Night, which came out this Halloween. I utterly loved Werewolf by Night, and I enjoyed the Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special. It's good to see this group again, directed and written by uh, James Gunn. Um, pretty, uh, most of the humor hit for me. Um, it just, for some weird reason, maybe it was the aesthetics or the look of it, it felt like kind of cheaply made. Huh. Like it felt like it was Guardians of the Galaxy, but like you could clearly tell they were like on a set. Um, <clears throat> there are some decent implications for the MCU going forward. And I, I think actually one of the things I love the most was the music in it. That's Yeah, that's interesting to hear that there's actually things of weight or things of meaning in the, in, in the entire MCU filtered into these smaller installments. Yeah, the uh, if you haven't seen it, this is in the trailer, so it won't really be a spoiler. But the premise is Peter Quill is kind of down on his luck after Thor dropped off the Guardians because Gamora has left. And Drax and Mantis uh, hear the story of his favorite holiday back on Earth, Christmas. And they think, well, let's get him a present to cheer him up for this holiday. And they know that his favorite person in the world is kevin bacon the hero from footloose <laughs> so they go to earth to abduct kevin bacon who is in the special quite a bit i love it that's yeah. awesome uh and it's pretty good again 45 minutes so it doesn't really overstay its welcome which is nice and uh so i have to say marvel's probably two for two with these special presentations okay Give all right what else you got close us out yeah the last thing um is going back a little bit. I think uh, probably finding this on the Turner Classic Movies section at HBO Max. Um, give it a look, anyone out there who who hasn't yet. It's got some good stuff. Um, but Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, 1969, Paul Newman, Robert Redford. Um, I had recently watched, and I think I talked about it on the pod, uh, Cool Hand Luke with Paul Newman in it because mm-hmm. I hadn't seen me, too many uh, Paul Newman films. And eh, I was underwhelmed with Cool Hand Luke. Butch Cassidy... Loved it. Um, it's a Western about Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid. So um, based on a, a lot of true events, obviously some embellishments from the movie, but um, it, it's kind of, it's a Western comedy almost, but not like overly comedic, um, but it has its light moments in it. Um, but yeah, it was actually different than I thought it was going to be going into it, um, but really enjoyed it. Um, they do some different things with like some, the way it's shot, like the opening scene is like in sepia tone, um, which, I mean, you, it doesn't, it's not a huge deal, but it kind of adds a cool little element. Then have some like funny montages in between of like robbing banks and like them traveling to different places. Um, I didn't know this but, movie had any humor in it, so that's kind of interesting yeah. here. Yeah, it's, it's all, I think it holds up being 30, 40, whatever, 50 years old almost. Um, wait, yeah, 53 years old. 
Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed it. And yeah, it's got some funnier moments. Uh, Paul Newman and Robert Redford, who played Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid, are hiding now in a shootout. And they're trying to get away. And one of them suggests, well, we'll just jump off into this river, which is probably like 75 feet down. <laughs> and uh, Sundance Kid, who's played for by Robert Redford, he's like, well, I, I don't want to jump. I can't swim. <laughs> and then Paul Newman comes back. He's like, well, the fall will kill you anyway. <laughs> yeah, he's like, why are you even worried about that? Dude? We're going to be dead by the time we go <laughs> to Which is funny. He's like, here's the way out. And then he defaults to like, well, you're going to die when you jump anyway. So He's like, well, in a weird way, that actually calms me down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um yeah kind of funny moments like that throughout it but um yeah definitely recommend that one even like for people who aren't like the biggest western fans i think think it still has a lot to it um and enough to keep people going i gotta say the the uh turner classic movies list is pretty fucking banging HBO, yeah hbo max is like it's killing it with that section um gives me a little a little blast from the past that I need every once in a while. I get to go back and refine my movie list a little bit. So I like it. I don't know like how they um, did did it, but like acquiring, it just seems like any good classic movie is part of the Turner classic movie catalog. Yeah. Like everything that we remember as kids is on there. Because I'm pretty sure we watched like even Wizard of Oz on there, right? <sighs> yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. Good for them. There's a ton of good stuff. I, I just want to say one more thing, just because I'm not going to talk about this much or anywhere else. But one other basketball documentary I watched on Netflix that you might be interested in, um, the Untold series, which are these like 50-ish minute, I think this one might be a little longer, sports documentaries that um, most of them take place around like the mid-aughts. But this one yeah. was called Untold Operation Flagrant Foul, and it's about the NBA referee Tim Donahue. Okay. who was caught gambling on games that he was officiating. And this is a story that I kind of remember when it happened. I don't remember all the details, but this the reason this documentary is interesting is Tim Donahue himself is like one of the main people interviewed. Mm-hmm. Um, and just hearing him discuss like ways that referees can impact games with like minutia, like almost not even necessarily fouls they call, but like, influence they can have on the other referees or things they can say to players that will like affect the way the players play. And then the gambling uh, reverberation of that outcome and how many hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars can be on the line is pretty yeah. wild. Yeah, there was, I was actually just trying to look it up. I can't remember what it was, but there was actually a podcast series I listened to probably one or two years ago about that same stuff. And yeah, it's super interesting. Um, I can't remember what it was. It was, I don't know. If anyone's out there and is it like a special just over this, or is it like they, they could just cover like true crime stuff? And... So it's like I'm trying to piece this together in my head, but that was like one series or segment of it. They did like seven, eight episodes just with the Tim Donahue stuff, and then the next thing they did was the admission admission scandal. Yeah, that uh, Uncle or Aunt Becky was in. I can't remember her name. Right. Yeah, um, and that was like a whole. I can't remember. It wasn't like called like crime or fraud or. I think because Netflix did a documentary on that too, which I've seen the college admission scandal. Yeah, I don't know. Listeners out there, Google it. But um, yeah, that that was a good one. And yeah, Tim Donahue he was really involved in that. The guy who was doing the podcast like had a ton of interviews and sound bites with him, and um, it was it was good oh, nice. stuff. I'll have to find that. Yeah, the Untold. There, they come out with like. I think this is the second season. Each one has like four episodes. Um, I've picked and chose which ones I've watched, but I've liked all three of them. So I like this one. There was Untold, The Girlfriend Who Didn't Exist, which is the Manti Teo story, the Notre Dame mm-hmm. linebacker who got... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the other one is Untold, The Malice at the Palace, about the Detroit Pistons-Indiana Pacers fight where fans got involved in the early 2000s. Yeah. So I liked all three of them. But again, I, I haven't so. watched all. I'm just kind of... There's a hockey one i haven't seen some others but this one was good i'll have to tune in (laughs) all right banner's not here to make the bird noise but uh moving on to the last part of our show which is our do you even lift bruh segment it's a question and answer segment where we ask a question about movies and we leave you guys to ponder your own answer as we provide you ours nate we are continuing our countdown of our top 100 movies of all time list uh, and as we do every episode, before we tell the listeners where we're at on our current list and what our next couple movies are, 
How would you describe these lists? Because as we always say, they're not the AFI Film Institute's top 100 movies of all time. No, these are definitely very apparently uh, specific to each one of our us as bros. Uh, these are very, uh, very, very, very varied. Yes. English is fun. Um, <laughs> like just for example, just looking at this. Uh, let's see here. Uh, number 67 for Geiger was Mean Girls. <clears throat> Uh, number 67 for Cycli was Interstellar. Uh, <laughs> two very different movies. And mine was uh, Mission Impossible Fallout. Another good movie. <laughs> we had Onward and Avengers Endgame to round out the, the four and five bro banner and Thurman there. Um, but yeah, these, I mean, these may mean something specific to each one of us because when it came out, what, how old we were, or the time in our life that we saw it. So. Um, these may pop up on our list for a variety of different reasons. So it's a fun exercise on the list right now. Nate and I are each going to count down our number 59 and number 58 movies. And as we're creeping towards the top 50, these are movies, you know, throughout our 34, 35 plus years of life. You have to think that we've seen about a thousand movies, give or take. So these are ones that hold a very special place in our heart creeping towards that top 50. Yeah. So, Nate, your number 60, which you counted down last episode you were on, was a movie that I'm not surprised is on your list, but very pleased to see. And that is A Simple Favor, starring Blake Lively and Anna Kendrick. What is your number 59, one ahead of that? 59, one ahead of that would be the 1998 Michael Bay classic Armageddon. Um, And I feel like I talked about this on a pod like three or four months ago just because it was in my protein shake and saw it. So... I won't spend too much time on it. Um, but this, along with another one that was on my list at actually 61, Titanic, um, it, they kind of came around around the same time, a year apart. Um, and it, it's funny because they both piqued my interest. One, going to the depths of the sea, some unknown territories that we didn't know about, and the other one going to space. So uh, nine, ten-year-old Thurman at the time. Um, really interested in kind of those things and like exploring things and, and all that. Um, and yeah, it's, it's always stuck, in, stuck in my, stuck in my heart for this one. Um, and a uh, ton of good moments in it. And I think maybe Simon Birch may have popped up on here. Yeah. At 82, this is one of the other early ones that I remember tearing up on. Oh yeah. Um, at a young age. That and speech Bruce of, Willis gives yeah, to AJ at the end. In one of the final scenes. So um, like I said, I, I talked about this one on the pod before, um, but yeah, it, it captured a young Thurman and has held on ever since. And I think you have to view this movie from the lens of when it was released, like the quote unquote end of the world movie. First off, this is done. This is like 75 percent, maybe more, 75 to 80 percent character. Yeah. And it just happens to be like they're trying to destroy a meteor. But that's actually a small part of the movie, really. But this was before that whole thing was like a subgenre, or maybe even a genre. So like the desensitivity we have now to a film using the trope of like, hey, the world might end. That's the stakes. Like you kind of roll your eyes now, like all right, Roland Emmerich. Back then, this was really kind of in its infancy. Yeah, this is kind of the OG. And then like you get into like the late, I mean, this was the late 90s, but even later 90s, 99, 2000, the early aughts. Yeah, you get like Deep Impact. You get all those other ones that came out um, around that same time. Um, because yeah, this movie worked, I think, right? Huh? Because this movie worked so yeah. well, people were like, hey, we can do that same thing. Exactly. Did they live up to Armageddon's hype? Probably not, in my opinion. But, I mean, this was kind of like that OG of the end of the world uh, subgenre um, that started. But, like like I said, it has some touching moments. has, I mean, a ton of great actors in it. I mean, you've got Luke Wilson, Bruce Willis. Um, you got Hart's Ben Justin. Affleck, you got Liv Tyler, you have uh, Buscemi. I mean, oh, yeah. the, the list goes Coach from Remember the Titans. Yeah, that guy that I can't remember his name ever. <laughs> Billy Bob Thornton, did we mention him? Michael Billy Clark Bob Duncan. Thornton. Uh, April O'Neil from the first Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, who's married to the coach from Remember the Titans. Boom. It all connects. It all comes back. The animal cracker that Ben Affleck probably fucked Liv Tyler with. I mean, I hope he still like has that as like a trophy, like somewhere in his house, <laughs> like hidden from J Lo. Display it proudly. She's cool with it. <laughs> yeah. Is that the animal cracker from Armageddon, babe? Sure is, babe. Yeah, it's probably worth a million bucks. Yeah, it's the rhino one. 
All right, what do you got? Good shit. My number 59 is Black Panther from 2018. Um, I think we all know the cultural significance of it. The late Chad Chadwick Boseman in an iconic role. The MCU showed an ability to carve out uh, space for an auteur filmmaker and Ryan Coogler to kind of come in and put his own stamp on the superhero genre that fit into what they wanted to do, but also was very self-reliant and told its own story. And I think Michael B. Jordan's uh, Eric Killmonger in the movie is maybe my top three Marvel Cinematic Universe villain for me. And then the soundtrack by Kendrick Lamar just fucking slaps, too. So It's got a lot going for it. Great it's film. It's got a lot going for it. Recently yeah. watched this um, in preparation for the new Black Panther, which I need to go see. But, yeah, it definitely lives up to the hype. Um, it wasn't one of those rewatches where I'm like – I'm uh, just kind of trotting along with it. I was fully invested the whole time. Um, and it keeps you going from like beginning to end. And uh, just Wakanda in and of itself is just one of the most unique and interesting settings in really any superhero movie that I've seen. Yeah, really is. I agree. There's a lot there. All right, Nate, what's your number 58 to round us out? Number 58. Um, this is another long one. Um, but I've seen it multiple times um very famous director martin scorsese um coming in at number what did you say 58 58 58 i've lost track uh the wolf of wall street um this is and like like when this came out this kind of like right in our wheelhouse too um we were 20 i don't know early to mid 20s something like that so i mean raunchy as hell has seen opens i think he's doing blow off a chick's ass a lot of great actors in it um and as as raunchy as the movie is and sometimes you obviously get away from some some good acting i mean you've got leo in this you've got um you've got margot robbie in it you've got a ton of other great characters and supporting roles um but i mean this this one just has a lot to it um it draws you in. It's based on true events. Cool. Love it. A scandal. Love it. Um, and then you have Martin Scorsese behind all of it. So, you know, it's going to turn out to be, to be a banger. Um, but yeah, it, it's one of those ones. It's three hours long, but it does not feel three hours long because I mean, they're doing cocaine most of the time. So it feels like you're doing cocaine. <laughs> um, the quaalude and, scene is great too. The quaalude scenes. I don't, I don't feel, should we take another one? Yeah, we should take another treadmill. <laughs> Get on the treadmill. Somehow I drove to the club unscathed, and he's like fucking hitting every single object on the road that he possibly can. <laughs> uh, and Leo, yeah, Leo's depiction of Jordan Belfort, which is like overly confident, can do anything in the world. Um, I guess it's a dialogue because there's some guy on the phone, but one of the greatest like dialogues in any movie is whenever he's like actually building his team together and he's pitching that guy on the stocks and as he's doing that he's <laughs> miming and imitating bending him over a barrel basically and showing him the 50 states yes um for a uh, <laughs> horrible bosses reference there i was gonna say great horrible bosses reference yeah but i mean he, he just played that character to a t um and jonah hill and it was great as well um it was kind of funny seeing him because going into it like he's got the pr- prosthetic teeth and everything he's playing a little bit different character than he's played before um but he played a great skeevy wall street salesman as well. Anytime I get drunk, I like to go Steve Madden. <laughs> uh, yeah, but yeah, really great one. Uh, Wolf of wall street was number 92 on my list. So this is one, I don't know if it'll be in all the bros top 100 list, but probably at least three out of the five. Yeah. Cause I know it's going to be on. Guidance. We talked about this. We're going to have to like compile and see who, <laughs> see what movie made all five or what yeah. else. Good shit. All right, this one, again, we made these lists at least a year ago, and we've updated them as we've gone on, but just happens to be great timing that uh, this one is my number 58, and that is National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, which, uh, of course, starts Chevy Chase, Randy Quaid, and his, I know he had a couple good uh, competitive roles to this one in the 90s with uh, Independence Day and Major League, but this, to me, is Randy Quaid's best role as... uh, cousin eddie and it is a once a year christmas time watch for me um it's in the rotation every year we watch it hilarious 
all the jokes uh, hold up. And if you've ever hosted relatives around Christmas, um, this is sort of therapeutic to watch Clark go through what he's going through in it. Uh, and nothing to me sets the tone like the holidays. There's a couple movies that like have to be a part of that rotation because they really get me in the mood for the Christmas spirit. And Christmas Vacation is case in point, like the the poster child of that. Um, this one may make an appearance later on my list. Um, oh. And I, honestly, out of any movie on my top 100, this may be one of the ones I've seen the most. But I mean, you kind of get that with like those Christmas or holiday movies because you'll they'll they'll be on during the holidays so much. Like you'll just watch 20, 30 minutes of it here and there. Um, but yeah, it's it's one of those that I've seen literally maybe a hundred times. And all the nice. jokes still hold up. They're hilarious. Happy <laughs> Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah. Go fuck yourself. Go fuck or no, kiss your ass, kiss his ass. <laughs> uh it's just yeah everything everything about this comes together um as far as cousin eddie's performance phenomenal in this so many quotes uh, i quote it maybe on a daily basis honestly it's, uh it's it's so so good um you serious clark i'll throw that one out all the time <laughs> his mock turtleneck where you can like clearly see <laughs> you no serious sleep. clark something real nice so nice um but as far as his performance Comparative to that, I really like him in Vegas Vacation. Cousin Eddie in Vegas Vacation. That's is true. I'll have Vegas. a little Ziella. And as you always say, Nate, don't get cheap on me. <laughs> don't, get, don't get cheap on me. <laughs> and they, like, switch the signs at the Yeah. Bottom. Oh, you're right. This one's chicken and this one's beef. So fucking gross. You know where I can get some damn bait? <laughs> His performance in that one is, is pretty phenomenal. But um, I wouldn't say one is better than the other, but I just had to give an honorable mention to his performance in, in that one. Yeah, and as this is released, it will uh, be December. So I'm I'm trying to figure out the order to watch um, my Christmas movies in. I think this one might be a little bit closer to Christmas because I think it's higher up on my must-watch list. Obviously, we have this, Home Alone, The Santa Claus, and for me, it's Jingle All the Way. It's the other one in that that rotation. Yeah. Try to keep it pretty tight. Solid stuff. All right, well... Thank you guys for joining us for episode 196. Nate, before we let the people go, any closing words of wisdom for our listeners? Um, let's see. What's uh, what's on the docket these days? Um, I don't know. Um, eat your veggies, I guess. Oh, that's good. I think I've thrown that out there before, but, you know, um, just try, trying to get those in. It makes you feel better. Um, and then you can go ham on the ice cream later, so... It's net neutral out. at that point. Yeah. Net neutral. One piece of broccoli equals two cups of ice cream. It's science. I think that's the equation. Yeah. Give or yeah. take. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I'll just say, uh, guys, make smart decisions when you go get your haircut. Again, it's not a permanent uh, look we're going for here, but it will last you several weeks. And I think more than anything, it's a pressure packed moment and it's a great time to really test your resolve. Like, can you make good decisions under pressure? You're gonna and find then out. one other thing I've seen. A little bit lately guys respect lines like if you walk up and a bunch of people are standing next to a cast register or a bathroom and you ask are you in line like why the fuck do you think they're standing there that's just their favorite spot part of the store i was at a restaurant like last week and me and two guys like me and a guy were like waiting for the bathroom some dude walked straight up to the door like we just want to fucking hang out here <laughs> Like, what do you think I'm doing? This is my favorite door to stare at sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I just want to stare at this guy's back while he stares at the closed door. <laughs> Locked. We just sit here sometimes and wonder, I wonder what's behind that door. Yeah, my wife's actually here on a date with another guy. I just come stand and <laughs> stare at the wall. It's like Narnia back there. I have no idea. It could be. The, the unknown is what makes it so fucking mysterious. Into the unknown. <laughs> All right, for the American Hero, Nate Thurman, I'm the Mayor, Jeff Hornacek. We are the Bro4 Squad Podcast. Thank you for checking us out. Please follow us on Twitter, at Bro4 Squad. We're on Instagram, although i got to be honest, I kind of dropped the ball on that one. I haven't really posted on there much. We'll get back on it. We'll pick it back up. Yeah, at Bro4 Squad there as well. If you type in Bro4 Squad as three separate words on Letterboxd, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, YouTube, pretty much anywhere you can find your podcast, you'll find us. And check out everything on our website, as long as our squad blog uh, with our updated top 100 movies of all time, bro4squad.com. Till next time, we'll see you at the movies. Especially if you're going to see Violent Night this Friday, because we'll be there. Yeah, me and uh, me and Horns have a, have a date night. 
What's the better tagline? Seasons beatings for Violent Night or Cocaine Bears get in line? I'm going to get seasons beatings. I like that one. <laughs> what was the other? There was something else I texted you about or t- told yeah, you. Yeah, it was like, was it something about Deck the Halls? It was like... Uh... Ah, fuck. Now I can't remember. I was trying to... 